Take a quick photo just before we start.
Um, I'd also like to acknowledge my colleague in the history department, um, Professor Gorath's uh, colleague and friend, Hasia Diner, uh, for helping uh, put this event together this evening, even though she can't uh, be with us, <laughs> unfortunately. I'd like to thank NYU Press, uh, who published the book under the admirable imprint of the Washington U Books. I like that uh, sound of that. Um, and who have co-sponsored uh, uh, this event. I'd also like to acknowledge uh, Judy Greenspan of the Center for Jewish History. Now, what we'll do this evening is after Professor Gorok's uh, lecture, uh, he will uh, take questions. Uh, we usually like to have a lively Q&A here in Ireland House. Uh, we'll then move downstairs for a reception. Um, everyone's invited, obviously, to that. NYU Bookstore will have copies of the book uh, available for, for sale and signing. So let me just close with a few words about uh, uh, Peter Quinn. Uh, quite a lot of words have been said uh, about Peter Quinn uh, this week, <laughs> uh, especially on Monday evening, uh, when in a scintillating display of eloquence and coruscating wit, <laughs> Peter was serenaded, or was it eviscerated, <laughs> by his friends before receiving the signal honor of the Eugene O'Neill Lifetime Achievement Award from Irish American Writers uh, and Artists, Inc. Uh, many of you know Peter, as he's been a central and beloved figure in Glaxman and Ireland House since its inception a little over a quarter century ago. The speechwriter for both uh, Governor Hugh Carey and Governor Mario Cuomo, Peter joined uh, Time Inc. as a chief, uh, chief speechwriter in 1985, and it was around that time uh, that I first met, uh, met Peter. I was a graduate student uh, in Columbia at that time. Uh, it soon became clear that what Peter really wanted to do was to write novels, uh, not speeches. Um, he was up at five o'clock or earlier every morning to write uh, before coming into the city, into the office. And the result in 1994 was his debut novel, Banished Children of Eve, which won the American Book Award. And Peter retired uh, with a large sigh of relief uh, <laughs> from Time Warner in 2007. And then in an extraordinary burst of creativity, published Looking for Jimmy, the book of essays about Irish America, and then a trilogy uh, of historical detective novels. But I left out the most important part. Uh, Peter is also, and above all, uh, a proud native son of the Bronx. Speeches on novels. <laughs> I learned all about fiction writing for a politician. <laughs> uh, Carl Jung wrote that the landscape of our childhood is the landscape of our mind. I lived in Parkchester from, from birth through college. My mother was in the same apartment and one met over for 44 years. I want to ask for a show of hands by people like myself who grew up in Parkchester. <laughs> I suspect it's substantial, but if your mind is divided into four quadrants with an oval in the middle, then you can't help but agree with Young. <laughs> the thing about growing up in the Bronx in the 1950s, and Parkchester in particular, was you never thought anyone would write a book about it. <laughs> it seemed so settled, so ordinary, so undramatic, so parochial. Points driven home by Patty Sheriff's 1955 film Marty one of Hollywood's rare forays into the Bronx. 20 years ago, soon after my wife Kathy and I moved from Brooklyn to Hastings, we took our kids to see where we grew up. We started where Kathy grew up, on Clay Avenue on 163rd Street, a few blocks from Yankee Stadium. Their reaction was muted. There were abandoned buildings, but it didn't look all that different from a lot of other places in New York. As we approached Parkchester on the Bronx River Parkway, a solid line of fortress-like red brick facades loomed over the low-rise neighborhood around it. My son, 10 at the, ten at the time, <coughs> and a World War II buff said, that looks like Stalingrad. 
Now, I don't know if he had ever seen a picture of Stalingrad, and I understood his reaction. In his imagination, Park just had a monumental quality that made it seem a bulwark capable of holding off the outside world. There was a socialist solidity to Park Chester, a level uniformity built not according to Karl Marx, but met life. It was in the Bronx, but unlike the Bronx. It was a housing developed and a social experiment, progressive in many ways and blatantly regressive in a shameful racial exclusion. It was new, but felt like and looked like it had always been there. It had generous swaths of grass, albeit it was a serious offense to walk on them. <laughs> it had access to public transportation as well as ample parking. It was an urban gateway to a suburban future. In Parkchest, a Bronx tale of race and ethnicity, Professor Jeffrey Gurak has produced an incisive and important history of one of, one of New York's most fascinating and innovative and important housing experiments. Professor Gurak gives us Park Chester's day-to-day -day realities, as well as its lasting significance. His book is a revelation. Reading it, I was reminded of Eliot's words, and the end of all our exploration will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. One final note from the Department of Time marches on. The seat in Congress that my father held as a Democratic representative of Park Chester and its virons is now held by Alexandria Ocasio. <laughs> there is such a thing as progress. Please welcome Professor Barra. However, she didn't live in Park just a very long That's part of the story. Thank you, Peter. I consider you a friend, a colleague, and as you'll see later on, he's also an important source in this book which underlies one of the major themes that I dealt with in the book. You know, writing contemporary history, bringing a story up to the present day is always a great challenge. And I teach at Yeshiva University, and I have colleagues who do medieval Jewish studies, and I often quip with them that when they give a speech, nobody gets up in the audience and says, I heard Maimonides, the 12th and 13th century Jewish philosopher, say such and such, and what you're saying is not there. We have people here who came from Parchester, I lived the first 25 years of my life, 1940-1974 in Parkchester. So in doing this book, I was always careful to test my recollections of what went on in Parkchester with those of other people, through memoirs, through newspaper accounts, through interviews, and the like. And Peter gave me a very important line, which we'll get back to later on. For myself as a historian, after 40 some odd years in this business of doing history, this is the first book that where Jews are not the centerpiece of activity. They are part of a larger story. As he outlined so well, Parkchester was a community, a planned community, 171 buildings, over 127 acres, previously undeveloped, which housed for the first 30 years predominantly Irish and Italian Catholics, a few white Protestants, and a substantial number of Jews. But it was racially segregated, first by law and then by custom. And we'll say more about that later on. Today, it is African American, Latino, immigrant Bangladeshi, Indian, Malaysian, Afro Caribbean, and African. And by the way, one of the things I learned early on that it's a misnomer to refer to people with dark pigmentation as black because Africans. African Americans and Afro Caribbeans have very different cultures and don't always get along. Now, in Jewish culture, we often talk about Ashkenazic Jews and Sephardic Jews not getting along. Well, in St. Paul's Lutheran Church, which is down the block on Virginia Avenue, where Barchester writes, I met the people there, and the African Americans and the Afro Caribbeans don't get along all that well in issues of ritual, ritu uh, issues of clergy, and the like. There are six mosques in Barchester. Uh, in its heyday, there were two synagogues. And I have to say, of, of the many things I've done in my career as a historian, one of the things I'm most proud of is that when our synagogue closed some 15 years ago, the Young Israel of Parkchester, I prevailed upon the dean of libraries to rent me a Yule Hall van. I got three strong students. We went to the synagogue and said, OK, fellas, take everything. We looted the synagogue of all its records. And there's not knowing that many years later, I used these records to document one aspect of the Parkchester history. It is a bucolic neighborhood. It looks the same. 
it survived physically, at least externally. Uh, many of the ups and downs of New York City history, as Peter so eloquently pointed out. Uh, but tonight, my major focus will be on Irish-Jewish relations in New York City and also in Parkchester. And my argument is that in Parkchester represented a bit of a turning point in how Irish and Jews got along. Now, prior to Parkchester 1940, Jews and Irish had a long history of not getting along. About 10 years ago, I spoke with Hasya at a, a gathering at the Irish consulate in New York, and my, I was asked to talk about wonderful things the Irish and Jews did together, and I was very, very difficult assignment. But I found one incident. Between 1945 and 1948, under William O. Dreyer, there was a cooperation between them and the Jewish radicals in Palestine called the Irgun to smuggle weapons, Irish longshoremen helping them smuggle weapons to Palestine because the Jews and Irish had one thing in common. They both hated the British. <laughs> but apart from that, I just want to chronicle for a few moments some of the points of conflict between Jews and Irish. First of all, in Jewish history, there's the famous or infamous funeral riot that attended the funeral of Rabbi Jacob Joseph, the one and only chief rabbi of the city of New York in 1902. It was a day-long funeral, and the funeral ended uh, a few blocks north of Grand Street at the Beit Midrash HaGadol, which I read today, the last remnant burned down or fell down, and sadly a, a construction worker was killed. And when the cortege went down Grand Street to the East River, they went past a factory that employed Irish American uh, workers, and they came out and they fought against the Jews, and it was a police riot. Most of the cops were Irish American. There's an, there's an Irish interpretation that says they weren't all Irish, and the cops weren't all Irish, who knows? But in Jewish history, that was seen as a major moment of conflict. Politically, Tammany Hall dominated uh, New York City politics and was very influential on the Lower East Side, although they were very smart. In the Jewish district, they had their protege or their lackey, depending on how you look at it, named Henry Goldfogel, who served with distinction for many years in the Congress to the great chagrin of the socialist Jews who wanted their own piece of the action. So there was conflict over jobs, unions, housing, and the like. The low point in Jewish-Irish relations took place in the 1930s, where under the influence of Michigan-based radio preacher Father Charles Coughlin, there was great activism and voice to anti-Jewish feeling. The feeling was that Jews were taking over the city. They were invading the civil service, which was dominated by the Irish. Uh, he motivated the Christian front and the Christian mobilizers who fought in the streets of Washington Heights and the South Bronx. And there were Jewish tough guys who fought against them. There was violence in the streets. However, soon thereafter, in Parkchester, there was no organized anti-Semitism no outbursts of violence, or even significant complaints that Jews were being roughed up in the streets or play areas. Now, I want to be clear about this. Animosities may have taken place within families. Negative feelings can be expressed over dinner tables and informally, but as a historian, it's very hard to get at what people are saying informally. Um, that's not easy to study. What I'm arguing is, and you'll hear Peter's important line later on, that in the same neighborhood where there was high voltage tension, these groups lived harmoniously for more than a generation until the 1970s where the rich next generation like me, college educated, my dad was a fireman, the number one occupation of Parkchester, men at that point moved out of Parkchester. And we, I think we took with us at least as a Jew, a sense of tolerance, ability to live one another. You know, I'm privileged to have in this audience but a dozen of my teammates, Jews and Gentiles, who played a great sport called lacrosse at City College. We are a diversified group. And we sometimes get along, <laughs> but not on religious basis and the like. So why was Park just a difference? Why was Park just a difference? 
So here's some thoughts of, of why they uh, got along. And also an indication that there are clear limits to how Jews and Irish did get along. Number one, Park Chess was owned until 1968 by the Metropolitan Life Insurance Corporation. As we both said a few moments ago, it was a planned com community, an, alter an alternative to suburbia, building up and not out. And when you got on the subway and you took five cents or 10 cents or 15 cents for 35 minute ride into New York City, you after a while could look at the Cross Bronx Expressway and you could see these poor suckers crawling out to suburbia. We're in Parkchester. We get to work and get back and live our family lives in this bucolic neighborhood. So commutation issue is very important. The Metropolitan Life Insurance Corporation was social progressives to some extent. They want a specific type of New Yorker, not too rich, not too poor, people with strong family values. And in fact, a social worker came to people's homes of people who wanted apartments and investigated how well they were living in their homes with white gloves looking for dust and the like. In my, during my work, I made the acquaintance of fine Monsignor John Graham, who's now a pastor in Throg's Neck. His family didn't get into Parkchester. They lived on Beach Avenue. When he became pastor, a pastor in, in, in Parkchester, he, he would begin his speeches by saying, I finally made it to Parkchester. <laughs> <laughs> and came on senior and became a... So, there was a sense in Parkchester, to use a Jewish term, that we all were chosen people. We were chosen to be in Parkchester. And people were placed in their buildings indiscriminately. The New York Times wrote 1940s, listen to this. The Arcuses, the Abbots, the Breslau, the Devores, the Jesuitses, and the McCanns all found their places in this new residential complex. Any New Yorker to tease out what we're talking about. And this sort of random placement broke down social barriers that characterized old neighborhoods and some of the new neighborhoods in other locales. It was more integrated in terms of ethnicity and religion than many <coughs> suburban locations. There's a classic study done of suburban Chicago called the Edge of Friendliness that points out that when Jews were given the option, uh, they were admitted into these areas of living among Gentiles or among Jews, more often than not, they chose to live among Jews. We as Jews didn't have that choice. Very important. Factor number two. I believe Park Chitterites got along very well because the Irish and the Italians and the Jews and other Christians were both coming into a spanking new fresh neighborhood. There was no sense of one group invading the other's turf. And that was one of the animosities that the Irish harbored against Jews that had stoked conflict in earlier inter-ethnic conflicts. Anything, given this vetting process of the Metropolitan Life Insurance Corporation, both Jews, once again, could see themselves as fortunate chosen people. So there's a chapter called Fortunate Apartment Dwellers, and it was a very long list of people who wanted to get in. These are the people who are lucky enough to be selected to live in the area. Just a sidebar issue, for Jewish leaders, in Parkchester, a minority, there was a very important issue in terms of identity. In one of my books that Peter mentioned, I interviewed Dolph Shays, great basketball player, and because I'm a sports guy too to some extent, and uh, he said when he grew up four blocks west of the Grand Concourse on Davidson Avenue, he felt the whole world was Jewish. And I checked the statistics. There's only three out of four people in his neighborhood who's Jewish. What was Jewish to Dolph Shays? The kosher delis, the synagogues, the butcher shops, the food stores with their Hebrew and Yiddish wording. You had none of that in Parkchester. So if you want to create a Jewish community, and there's no Jewish community center in Parkchester, no YMHA in Parkchester, so it's a very mixed environment. And I suggest that most of the Jews who moved there didn't care much about whether they continued to identify Jewishly. You know, one of the great preservers of the Jewish people in America is the Jewish neighborhood. This was not a Jewish neighborhood. It was an integrated neighborhood, again, socially 
and uh, but not racially. Factor number three, excuse me, shared patriotism. Now, in Jewish historiography, the years 1939 to 1945 are arguably the worst years in our long and distinguished history during the Holocaust. But for American Jews, World War II is a good time, a time which tempered negative feelings. We fight along with other Americans, and we're, we're seen as that. I won't go into the story of the Dorchester, the famous story of the Dorchester, where you, I guess I am going to that story. <laughs> we're four, we're four clergymen, two Catholic, two Protestant ministers, one Catholic priest, and a rabbi go down with the ship. This is the Jewish Iwo Jima moment here. Well, that took place, we had no Dorchester and Parkchester, but the sense of working together in the war effort, the United Victory Committee, which had Jews and Gentiles together, and from Jewish sources we know how pleased they are that they can be part of the Knights of the Columbus Parade in Parkchester, <laughs> were part of that group. And I came across an interesting criminal incident that received press coverage, but did not lead to an outbreak of anti-Semitism. Minnie Levine was arrested for price gouging in her butcher shop. She was arrested, and when she went on trial, one of the witnesses against her was Lorraine Helfand of the United Victory Committee. She led the charge, and it's very possible that she was a Jew and was noted as instrumental here in hauling Levine into court. She said, Levine said, that she didn't understand any English, and she only understood, understood Yiddish, and that was the rationale. But well, she was convicted, but you see this United Victory Committee, inter-ethnic, inter-religious groups working uh, together. Fourth factor, which comes out of being an urban historian, and I imagine the Park just to write will resonate to this. One of the things that I'm interested in, because there's an average guy, is how people live their lives, their actual lived lives. There was a structural omission in construction protocols there would play Parkchester for generations that brought people on the same floor together. No air conditioning. No air conditioning. For ventilation, and in new, you know what? When six people tell you the same story, it has this ring of similitude for sure. They talked about the fact that civility pre prevailed during the summer because people opened their doors and their windows for cross ventilation. In some cases, this led to floor parties between the, among the different groups, and this represented a profound change in attitudes between the ethnic groups. I gave a talk uh, a week ago at my local synagogue about Parkchester, and I noted the fact that there was a woman who lived 99 years, and she just passed away recently, and it was Irene Horowitz, and she did a tape, and she said, oh, we have to know our Christian neighbors very well because we were part of this type of activities. This lack of air conditioning was a one generational phenomenon. The next generation wanted out, Jew and Christian. <coughs> what did our parents do to avoid air conditioning? Well, there was the Lowy's American, which is a Marshall store today, which ran double features, so you could have four hours of air conditioning. And Peter told me that his family saw the Ten Commandments. My father and I went to the movies. He took us to see a double twice to see the Ten Commandments. That's ten hours. That's ten hours. <laughs> and you could have converted it for most of the Or, or, you hung out at Macy's, Marcus, which, was, which was the first non-Herald Square uh, outlet. And when, when uh, Macy's cut back on their uh, outlets, Parkchester has survived, I'm pleased to say. The other piece of the story is, this is beautiful metro metropolitan oval, which is still beautiful today. People would, would stay there till all hours of the night because of the air, lack of air conditioning. And you know, uh, one of these things that one of the believe it or not, one of the positive sides of no air conditioning is that you're with your neighbors. When you're in your in air conditioned car, you're in air conditioned house, you never see anybody else. So that's part of the story. Now Co-op City comes along in 1960, in the late 60s as an alternative, and that's a problem. Because it looks like Parkchester, it's bigger than Parkchester, it's larger than Parkchester, and higher than Parkchester, and it has air conditioning, right? And then rich folks like ourselves move to Riverdale. Uh, my wife, I'm pleased to say, is here tonight, and uh, when we got married, my parents had, and we inherited the bungalow up in Danbury, Connecticut, 
I don't realize now in doing this research why my parents got that bungalow. They're gonna wait from the heat. So we were married in June 74. I had a fellowship for August 74. So my parents said, why don't you move into Barchester during the summer? I should have been in an air-conditioned building. The first night she says, how the hell are you living here? <laughs> the marriage has survived, but it's survived. Uh, factor number five, most importantly, the shared men's working experience. They worked at comparable jobs. Most women stayed at home. My mother was actually was a bookkeeper, and she worked in the Empire State Building on the third floor. Well, someone's got to be on the third floor, right? <laughs> anyway, this is an indication that they're working together in low white collar jobs, cops, firemen, postal workers, office workers working for the municipality of the city. They're all working together and they're all marching down the street, marching down Metropolitan Avenue to that elevated subway. They're marching uh, together to a place they would call the city. We're going into the city to work. Finally, uh, as far as Catholic priests are concerned, Jews don't really understand the significance of many Jews of Vatican Council II, which absolved Jews of the deicide charge which had undermined Jewish-Christian relations for millennia. Generations of youngsters are now growing up and they're not being taught this sort of activity. Uh, and it also reminds me, I'm making note of this, that having mentioned Father Conklin, there was an anti-Conklin strain within the Catholic leadership in the 30s and 40s, and a number of the most outspoken anti-Coglin priests were in the West Bronx, where some of the Catholics who moved to Parchester attended church before moving to Parchester. Now, I have to be honest with you and say that I was unable to determine whether they were actual congregants of that, you know, that particular uh, strain of thought. But when you have no evidence, you say zeitgeist and you move on. Zeitgeist is <laughs> the tenor of the times. Uh, one of the most distinguished Catholic priests, later Monsignor, was Father Scanlon. And St. Helen is the largest church in Parchers. Their law, L-O-R-E, was that they helped build, they helped secure the land for Temple Emmanuel, which was on the same block. Uh, they called it Interfaith Road. On that Benedict Avenue, you had St. Helen is down there, the Baptist Church here, and you had uh, Temple the Emmanuel. Presbyterian. Uh, maybe, maybe, maybe you're right, it was a Presbyterian. Check the book, it's fine. <laughs> okay. Okay. But, no, but it was interfaith road because Park, there were no schools in Parkchester, within Parkchester, and there were no churches or other houses of worship in Parkchester. I think, and I'm pretty certain, that they didn't want what we call the wrong element coming into Parkchester, which wouldn't be Caucasian along those lines. Uh, I mentioned a number of times that I'm a, that I'm a sports guy. So uh, one of the people I interviewed was a Jewish player who played uh, for the Vikings, which was a team sponsored by St. Helena's Church. And he, he said he was a great player. Everybody says they were great players. And he said at one point he was taken out of the game and he was sitting on the bench, and Father Scanlon uh, ambled over to him. He said, young man, I haven't seen you at mass recently. <laughs> So we're getting along. Jews and Catholics are getting along in the predominant Irish neighborhood. But there was an edge of the friendliness that should be noted. Again, that term I'm borrowing from the Lakeville studies, and that is how close were them. Here's where Peter Kin Quinn steps up. He wrote, we live separately together. I had no Jewish friends and no acquaintances with Jewish girls. But at the same time, these are his words, there were no so-called Irish pogromists who the Jews feared in other neighborhoods. I want to investigate that a little bit more. The foremost testing ground, at least for boys, and to a lesser extent girls, was a time after school let out. The Catholic kids, most of them went to St. Helena's, or St. Raymond's, the older church in the neighborhood, thank you, for sure, and the Jewish kids, went to public school, 102, 106, 127. I went to a Jewish school, I, I, I rode the subway, so I only saw my Jewish friends and Catholic friends on the weekends. Uh, the sports experience in those playgrounds, which I investigated, 
fights break out between kids, as often happen, you know, hard fouls and the like. But rarely did you did you see uh, Jews being called Christ killers by those who they're fighting with. Although some of my people I spoke to said on occasion. At the same time, you know, when you do this research, you think you're the only guy on the block, right? It turns out there's a fellow, and there's a map in the book, uh, who, who's done some research on the existence of youth gangs in New York City in the 40s and 50s. If you know your theater, you know West Side Story is based upon the, the youth gangs. So he, there's a map which I reproduced, which shows where all the gangs were, organized gangs, okay? And there's one place where there are no gangs, and that's in Parkchester either because we're the most wonderful people in the world, but also because of those Parkchester cops who took people's names if you stepped out of line, okay? okay? In, the, in the 1940s, there was actual attempt to evict people because they had too many rap sheets. I, I, I told Peter that one of the people I interviewed said that he was a good boy, but he was an unindictable co-conspirator <laughs> and who mouthed off to a police, to a Parkchester, they were unarmed, police uh, cop. And uh, when, he, when he got married, they wouldn't give him an apartment. He had to bring in his father-in-law, who was lieutenant in a police department, to vouch for him as being a legitimate citizen. That is a story which Catholic and Jewish kids, and now adults, uh, uh, told one another. There's one other important word about the playgrounds, which is my segue. When we played ball on the playgrounds, African Americans were not seen in the playground, on the streets, or in the stores. The social engineering of the Metropolitan Life Insurance Corporation did not, uh, well, kept up with the tenor of the times. And I'm now telling my students something which I've, my consciousness has been raised, and that's until 1944, excuse me, 1954, sorry, uh, our city is a very segregated city, not only by custom, but by law. And we often talk about, you know, going down south and the civil rights workers and south of the Mason-Dixon line. Segregation was rampant in New York City and the same thing was true of Parkchester and the landmark Board of Education uh, uh, versus the, uh, the segregation decision, excuse me, Metropolitan Life Insurance Corporation had the courts on their side. So in 1953, a group of Jewish communists living in Parkchester attempted to desegregate Parkchester by subletting their apartment to a black family, the Decaturs. He was a World War II veteran, and a Metropolitan Life Insurance Corporation attempted and succeeded in throwing them out of the, out, out of the complex. In fact, before they were sold out, there's Channel 11 WPIX had a show called Meet the Decaturs to promote consciousness about them. Jackie Robinson was on the show. In any event, how did, I, how did I find this out? Well, the Metropolitan Life Insurance Corporation has and maintains an archive, which is open to scholars. And sure enough, in the archive, there's a law journal article written at the University of Chicago Law Review, this is not University of Mississippi Law Review, by the General Counsel of Parkchester, I would say bragging, term that's used a lot in contemporary poems today, how they were successful in keeping blacks out of the neighborhood to protect the fiduciary rights of the, the white owners of Parkchester. And there's a little note that says, footnote, Daily Worker, the communist newspaper, which I then accessed and found out the entire story about the Decatur. In subsequent years, as things get better, Parkchester remains uh, remains segregated by custom. It was very hard to get off the list. And there are memoranda in the archive which tell the employees what to say if a black family shows up. Mr. Brown, we want you in Park just to sign your name, you're on the list. But you never get off the list. You never get off the list. Father uh, Thomas Derivan, who was a longtime priest at uh, St. Helena's, who's become a very dear friend, had a line that said, there were more relatives of nuns and priests in Parkchester per capita than any place in the city. All they had to do was call up the manager and they jumped the line. Jumping the line, very important. Some Jews say there were quotas in Parkchester. There's no evidence of that. When Rabbi Schwartz, who was my rabbi, wants an apartment, 
He doesn't get the apartment right away. It takes two months, but then he gets in. It's only 1968. The New York State Human Rights Commission tells the owners of Metropolitan Life Insurance Corporation that not only will we continue to fine you, which until then was the cost of doing business, we're going to throw you all in jail. At that point, the segregation ends in Parkchester, even though it seems from the records it took a while for the uh, idea to filter down to the employees, and it's all in the archives. You know, you're sitting in an archive for days and you find nothing, and all of a sudden, you jump out of your seat, of course there's nobody else around, and you say, boy, I found something, which is very important. One other issue here, um, how were the African Americans uh, received when they moved into Parkchester? Well, there's no organized opposition. Uh, there is some nastiness. I call it a mixed reception. Some of the African Americans who I spoke to talk about people slamming doors, uh, uh, elevated doors in their faces and the like. And uh, because the tactics of the NAACP and the Urban League was not to protest within Parkchester, but to go downtown and to the courts and fight against the Metropolitan Life Insurance Court. So you don't have demonstrations in Parkchester, Parkchester which would raise the ire, so to speak, of uh, some of the, uh, the whites in the neighborhood. More importantly, and this is my own personal disposition, I've met some of these people who are still alive and live in Parkchester. Well, first of all, it's sort of interesting, they were, um, some of them worked pro bono and for salaries for the NAACP and the Urban League. So when Park just opened, they said, holy cow, we're gonna do just what the uh, whites do. We're gonna jump the list and we get in first. So I've met some of these people. And frankly, they remind me of my parents, of my parents' generation solid working class, low middle class people who have moved into Parkchester and have stayed there for the last 30 or 40 years. Uh, we often as historians talk about the 1970s during the decline of New York City of white flight, of whites fleeing New York City. It's true, but I introduced, I think, the term of black flight. When the South Bronx is destroyed, you remember Cosell says the Bronx is burning? Where do the solid middle class and lower middle class and working class blacks, families, white gloves, move to, to Parchester. They take over that neighborhood, and there is a calm transition. And we move out, I argue, not because we were driven out, because we are doing better, and we want to take a step up along to those lines. Finally, uh, uh, after 1968, the blacks and whites have a common enemy. And the chapter called Mrs. Helmsley Should Do Her Time in Parkchester, <laughs> which is a line that Father Duravan gave uh, to me, which I've used in this book. They have a common enemy. The uh, uh, Helmsley Spare Corporation wants to turn Parkchester into condominiums. There's great concern that the old residents will be kicked out. There are unity rallies, and there are pictures of the leaders, uh, uh, blacks and whites working together. And this common enemy continues for the longest time. Um, finally, let me tell you a little bit about what Parkchester looks like today. I only reveal the last three pages of the book that I'm a son of Parkchester. And I end the book with two stories that I want to share with you. First, my wife and I took two of our granddaughters to a children's concert in Metropolitan Oval two summers ago. And you know, like, kids like to have their faces painted you know, before the concert. We're the only two white folk there. I feel very comfortable. My son-in-law said, you can't go there. I said, we fine. Cool. I feel very comfortable there. So as the kids are having their faces painted, I'm dialoguing a Latino woman. She's 38 years old. And I asked, well, how do you like living in Parkchester? Remember, her grandmother couldn't live in Parkchester. She says, you know, Parkchester was a wonderful, wonderful name, but now it's all ruined. I said, why? Because there's so many damn Bangladeshis in this world. And they have these strange, smelly foods. They have so many children. They're not like that used to be. Now, I didn't take her on. I just recorded for the book. And I don't identify her by name. On the other hand, our synagogue is now a mosque. It's a Bangladeshi mosque. So I went, did someone say Sam? I'm not sure. I went back to the, to the mosque to interview the imam. Lovely gentleman, 
and was speaking, but his heavily accented English, you know, we speak an accented English too, but happens to be Bronx accent. <laughs> so I'm not getting anywhere. Kid comes over to me, 17 years old, and says, sir, can I help you? So he helps me. And then he says to me, would you like to see the other five mosques? So we make an appointment to uh, uh, come back the following week, and we go to the other five mosques. I take my shoes off, my shoes on, my shoes off, my shoes on. <laughs> I tell them I'm Jewish, there's no problem. They're intrigued that I had lived in Parkchester and they want to know what life was like in Parkchester through all these years. I'm having a great time. So as we're driving around, I said, you know, just give me a second. Thank you. When I was a kid, we lived around the corner, literally from where you live today. And on a snowy or cold winter morning, the phone would ring at 6.30 in the morning, and the rabbi would be on the phone, and my father would answer the phone, okay guys, we're getting dressed. We're going downstairs to make a minyan. For an Orthodox service, you need 10 men, liberal Judaism, and 10 people for a daily service. Um, by the way, before I finish the story, using the synagogue records, I was able to see how the synagogue declined. When the rabbi first says, we need people, we really need men, we're gone by the, we're desperate, and finally the rabbi leaves the community because he says, it can't be a synagogue without a daily minion. Anyway, so I said, we'd go to services, and after services, my dad would rush off to the subway. The old timers would hang around and have a couple of belts of schnapps and whiskey to get their motors running to get out in the cold. And the rabbi would give me a reward. He handed me a shovel and told me to shovel off the sidewalk, which I did. So the kid says to me, that's awfully interesting, I use the same shovel. <laughs> I, don't think it, I don't think it's the same shovel. But, but let me tell you about this kid. He graduated Bronx High School of Science. He's going to NYU, majoring in electrical engineering and minoring, minoring in business. He has a weekend job. He runs a religious youth group in that mosque. I ran a similar thing in that synagogue. And Taz Madal Islam has one advantage over me. He lives in an apartment that has air conditioning. <laughs> so, what does this tell me? I think when you think of the Irish and Jews in the 40s and 60s and whites and blacks in the era that followed, I think commonalities in economics and social class Often, you'll excuse the verb, trump social, racial, and religious animosities. And I hope that some of the people who lived in Parkchester took this sense of tolerance and cooperation that the sons and daughters of firemen and cops and postal workers, when they gained the economic wherewithal to move on elsewhere and raise their children, took a Parkchester spirit of getting along with them. That's what the book is all about. Thank you very much. So we have plenty of time for questions. Uh, I hope we can uh, open up a good conversation. We'll be passing uh, a mic around so everybody can hear. Uh, just to start the, the, the rolling, um, and thank you so much for that, for that wonderful lecture. Uh, very straightforward question, but before 1968 and desegregation, um, I was wondering, I mean, what is the process for getting into Parkchester? Because at least one rabbi was delayed and one future Catholic priest was rejected. <laughs> so what's the... Well, uh, Catholic, so, priest, uh, Catholic priest's parents were rejected in the 40s. Interestingly, his, his uh, father, Graham's father, was a, uh, a subway conductor. So he should have gotten in, because uh, that was tough. But, and he said that the family were, they were not monster children. But something must, must have gone awry where they extort. The Harwoods family in their building were the one family in that one building. You live uh, off St. Lawrence Avenue, not too far from Parkchester, right? They get in. Sadly, you know, I never, I never asked my parents who were long gone how they got into Parkchester, but I know they live only three block, blocks away. So that's that piece, okay? Getting off the list was, was very, very difficult. But as we say in Hebrew, protexia, people had, had some protection that if you were well-connected in the Catholic community, or in this case, 
the Jewish leader who led the so-called protest, he didn't give the rabbi his apartment, they wrote letters and they had some politicians write letters, so they're able to jump the list. So what I'm trying to say is, it was very difficult, and people lived in Pontus till they died. People didn't move out. It was very difficult to get off the list, but if you're African American or Latino, you had no chance. And they, again, there were protocols, there were discussions of what we're supposed to do, even when in 68, as this noted quickly, in 68 when they, they, they said we have to desegregate, they dragged their feet a while. Now, to the Helmsley's credit, their issue was not black and white, different color, green. green. <laughs> green. So th that was the vetting process. Was it the same in Stuyvesant Town? Uh, Stuyvesant Town. There was a black in Harlem, there was another <clears throat> metropolitan light. Right, okay. So two things. First of all, working backwards, since Stuyvesant Town was built with city money with the help of Moses, not the they could, they were forced to integrate after 54 much quicker than Parkchester. But the Decatur's who I mentioned in Parkchester was the second step. The first mm -hmm. step started with a Jewish communist professor at City College of New York during the Carthy era, who lost his job in City, by the way, because he was a communist, mm -hmm. who tried to integrate Parkchester, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Stuyvesant Town was unsuccessful, having failed then, he took a group of his friends up to Parkchester and they had meetings. Uh, the NAACP records, which are available in the New York Public Library, has all the brochures and all the flyers. So there was a direct connection. Stuyvesant Town was more integrated than Parkchester. The other thing about Stuyvesant Town is they also had Peter Cooper Village, mm -hmm. which was upscale more than, we had nothing of that in Parkchester. And one of the strange things was, they, the Parkchester management didn't want to have too many physicians in Parkchester. They thought they were making too much money. They wouldn't be good. For, they had some very strange calculi <laughs> along those lines. So that's part of the story. Jack. Hi, my name is Jack Hirschfield. Use the mic. I don't need a mic. And, uh, <laughs> I lived in Parkchester. We were the fifth tenants in Parkchester in 1940. And I can vouch for almost everything that Jeff said. Ah. And, and I agree with everything that he said. There was one thing that he forgot, or maybe he didn't know, but there was a gang in Parkchester, and they were called the Purdy Street Gang, and they were Irish, and us Jews, didn't venture into Purdy Street after schools. We, we knew we would be chased away. And, and if we didn't run fast, we'd have a problem. Other than that, everything he said uh, was true. I ran a reunion for 15, I had 1,500 kids that came in 2010. And like Jeffrey said, when we grew up, we weren't allowed to walk on the grass. But we had 1,500 kids walking on the grass at that reunion, all at the same time for probably the first time in their lives. Okay? We had four tents set up, one for St. Helena's, one for St. Raymond's, one for Public PS 102, and one for PS 106. We have four tents, a thousand chairs, and a hundred tables. You don't know what a reunion that was. It was the best, the best of times. And I thank you very much for talking about it. And it sort of made me fail <laughs> a warm feeling in his heart. <laughs> to, to, to listen to him. You know, there was, a, there was a, uh, Italian neighborhood across Castle Hill where when we came from St. Raymond's, we wanted convoys because the Italian kids were rougher than so, we were. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, Jack, let me just respond. Mm -hmm. give, 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 give. Two things. Number one, Purdy Street is, is the outside right. limit of Parchester. Right. So these gangs. 
habituated more as Castle Hill, more outside of Parches. So they may have caused trouble for you, but more importantly, eluded the Parches, the cops, and not setting up shop within Parches. Now, he made a very interesting point that's mentioned in the book I didn't mention tonight, and that is, he said the, the, the Italian and Irish kids often fought in the schoolyard. So who was smarter, the, the, the St. Raymond's kids went the full day, and the St. Helena's kids went less than a full day, and I wrote in the book, well, this may be true, or it may be a, uh, you know, a typical, my priest is better than your priest type of thing, but who knows? It was true, and kids from St. Raymond's to this day are smarter than kids. Well, they are. <laughs> 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 and, and, and he said, and he said, you were borrowed from a St. Helena's family then? The woman all the way in the back. You, you have the mic? I just wanted to make a comment. Please. Um, I grew up in the Bronx, New York, and I my parents, uh, my father was one of the tax assessors that that uh, worked with Park Fester, and we got a front apartment, which we're very grateful. And I, I, uh, they moved in 1939, the original tenants, and of course left uh, when they were just too old, and, and uh, uh, you know, they had their well on years. Um, and then I moved back when I got married and had my first child there also, so I saw it for many, we did for many, many years. One of the things that I think is so interesting, I, when I was a child, I was extremely friendly with my the Irish neighbors. I have pictures of our birthday parties, and they, they, they were Jewish, and then they're the Fox uh, girls, and the, the Monahans, and, and uh, we played together. And then we, we became segregated when we went to school. Because my, I went to PS 106, and then junior high school 127, and I actually taught there. Um, and I, we, we brought the whole, everybody was Jewish for the most part. I think we had on one hand the number of kids. It went 27, yeah, yeah. So I, I, I wonder, I, I always think that I knew that I came from an Irish Jewish neighborhood. I never thought it was Italian at all. I mean, yeah. Irish seems extremely uh, very present to they me. They predominate, sure. Um, in fact, I always thought that all, all Christians were Catholic. It was a shock to me. <laughs> 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 Um, but but the reality is that uh, once kindergarten started, they went to St. Helens and St. Raymond's, we were no longer hung out together. And yeah. I, I find that, I mean, now we're back on it, it was really uh, So the, So this uh, Irene Horowitz had a, has a daughter-in-law who went to 127 while they were early classes, and she said there was a rumor in the school at one point that there were some black kids in the school. But she was there for two or three years, she never saw a black kid. And there's another story, there was a man who was uh, part of the Parchester Christian Association, like the YMCA, and he was, he, one day, he went, one evening, he was on a bowling team at the Chester House. My folks lived on top of the Chester House, in Metropolitan Avenue for a while. And he saw the, the, the black kid who was the pin boy, he left, and a Parchester cop escorted him to the subway. This is 1949, I checked the book, what year it was, and it was a shock to him. And uh, we didn't see, we, and if, one other thing I might mention, the way the subways were ran, and I'm so interested in subways. Now I'm not, I'm not sure Robert Moses had anything to do with it, but if you took the local express, the first stop in Parkchester, Westchester Avenue, Burr Avenue, what were all the stops, once you got to Parkchester, the next stop was Hunts Point. So you skipped over the South Bronx. And the next stop was Third Avenue, and then you were in Harlem. Next thing you know, you're in Yorkville, and you, uh, you know, you breathe a sigh of relief, you feel that way. You never saw people who were different from you who lived in these, in these neighborhoods. So I think that's, and that's, that's. That was the express train. The, the local, local express, stop. Local the local express. express, right. You could, yeah. you could take the local express and That's skip good. over no, St. Whitlock, Whitlock Avenue and then you know, uh, South Avenue. Right, right, right. There's a right. woman in the back with, in the pink. Do you have yeah. your hand raised? No, yeah. I, have a, I have a lady here, so, sorry, there's a bit of a line. I have a lady here, let go. Okay. Hello. 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 I'm a journalism student, and so I don't mind uh, actually the Bronx, and I chose Parchester because of uh, the different ethnic groups in the area. So I was wondering, how would you describe the relation of the ethnic group in Parchester today? Uh, is it comparable to that of the Irish and Jewish relations of the old Parchester? Yeah, I, 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 I the quick, you heard the question. I, I think the, I think the get along attitude 
continues among these different ethnic groups towards one another. But as I indicated at the outset of my talk, if you look inside church life or mosque life, uh, life, you see that there are cultural differences. Let me expand that for a second. So St. Saint Paul's Lutheran, which is down the block from Pacha Islamic Center, former Young Israel Parkchester. So when I went there, I found out that you have Africans, African, Afro-Caribbeans, and Africans. And there's conflict. One of the conflicts that's so interesting is, and this is true also the Presbyterian Church, which is all, all black, but it's not black, is that Afro-Caribbeans are not used, we're not used to having a Afro-Caribbean or black-skinned pastor running services. Although they were black, they were used to having white folk running the services. And the African-Americans said, what are you talking about? You know, get with it. <laughs> get with it. And only now did they have, I think his name is uh, Minister Otero, who's the first Latino pastor. So as a Jew, when I often talk about the differences within, within Jewish culture between people of different backgrounds, to the outsiders, they look the same. But inside, you have very, very different kind of perspective. So if you want to talk to me further afterwards, that's fine. OK, thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Craig? So, yeah, a, quick, a fast question. Has the population changed much over the years? Over the years. In terms of numbers? I know the, the, podcast, the population has pretty much remained the same. And secondly, are there any Jews left? Yeah, OK. So sure. Uh, 33,000 people live in Parkchester. The number is a, is a stagnant number. It cause, of course, this woman says the Bangladesh that she's had more children, but about 35,000 people. There are hundreds of thousands of alumni out there, and some of them have been in touch with me. Okay, Are there any Jews living in Parkchester? Well, no temples. Well, well, yeah, okay, Temple Emmanuel folded a few, a few years ago. When Young Israel Parkchester folded, the remaining old, old, elderly Jews who were members, Chabad, Lubavitch Hasidim, who are outreach masters to the Jewish group, stepped up and they moved into Parkchester for a while and they established a Hasidic group and a Chabad outreach group um, and invited the remaining elderly Jews to pray in their mosques, in his mosque. His name is Sheikh, Sheikh Musa Dram. And I, he's in the book, and he's been involved in Muslim Jewish relations, and he's been an advocate for tolerance between the two groups. Sadly, to it, and and the emissaries from Chabad who live on Eastern Parkway would walk 15 miles every Saturday to lead services, and they found an apartment. They found an apartment for them. So for a while, they were still active, as the number of Jews dwindled to almost nobody. So there are almost no Jews in Parkchester, but of course. You know, when you study Jewish history, you always look at who was the first Jew to move in, and we got at least four or five options here, right? There, I found a gentleman who's our age in his late 60s, Jewish guy who lives in Parkchester, and he told me that as a kid, he used to sneak around the labyrinth underneath of Parkchester buildings, which was built because of fear of, of uh, you know, World War II bombing it never happened, thank, thank goodness. Interestingly, in the records of Pop, the architectural records of Pop just there's no indication this thing existed, but it did exist. So uh, a few days ago, I got an email from someone. I told Peter this story, or I told Kevin. The guy wrote to me and he said, um, uh, I heard that you did this book from this other fellow. And do you know, are you in contact with Peter Stein? Now, Peter Stone was a kid I knew growing up. And when I got captured by the Parkchester cops for climbing over the fence to play basketball, they said to me, what was your name? I said, Peter Stone. <laughs> when he got stopped, he said, my name's Jeff Gura. I haven't met him in 65 years. So there are almost no Jews living in Parkchester. And, and, oh, one last thing. The, the synagogue I belong to in, in bucolic, upscale Riverdale the Hebrew Institute of Riverdale has eight families that were Parkchester alumni. Alumni, And we moved like any immigrant migration. The first person gets in and says, you know what? Awfully nice here. And the second and third family, we've been there 
Pamela and I for 40 years in that congregation. We were very outstanding rabbi. We didn't join that congregation because of the rabbi. We wanted to pray with people we knew from the old hometown. The old hometown was Rochester. Good question. Thank you. Sir, could you say a little more about the Italian community in Rochester? Did you hear Can I just give you that, sir? I thought they were equal with the Irish and Jewish, apparently not. No, the, the, could you say a little yes, more about okay. it? Yes, okay, and you can help me. I think yeah. there, there was an Italian neighborhood, of course. They, they preferred to own houses. That yes. was our reading. And they right. had little gardens. Right. And the toughest kids in the Bronx, we felt, lived there. Right, on the outskirts of Parchers. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But, yeah. but within, within Parchers, I We went to school with them, but we didn't live with them. We lived with Jews. Went to school with the Italians. That's right. as an Irish Catholic. But there were, there were more, more in, in St. Raymond's than in yeah, Saint, because of Castle Hill. Right. So, okay. so St. Raymond's so was, was, the was heavily Italian. St. Raymond's was the mother church of the area. Oh, by the way, I didn't mention what was what was there before Parkview was built. There was nothing there. It was a Catholic protectory uh, oh. area for wayward children, etc. This is open land <laughs> in New York. And if you're interested in the history of construction and unions, they built 151 buildings like two or three years, and it came up like topsy, like, like crazy. Okay, uh, sports fans, Jim Laranga, who was a coach uh, at the University of Miami, he's a Parchester guy. So they're, they're Italians, but uh, as the woman said, you felt that there was a great Irish influence. As a Jew, you didn't go into St. Raymond's or St. Elvis. I've been there now. This is a revelation to me, you know. And uh, of course, the students in those schools, uh, most of them are immigrants. One, there's so many things I can say, but one other thing. The people who live in Parchester today who are uh, non-whites, Parchester isn't the, like Jews in Italian, this is important, and Irish, Parchester wasn't the first place they came to in America. So for example, in Washington Heights is the most is the largest Dominican community in New York City. The Dominicans who live in Pontchester are, are, are a, a slice. In other words, for them it's a step up or a step away from their identity. Those are two different things. And they're opting to live in a heterogeneous neighborhood. Sounds awfully like the story of Jews, Irish, and Italians of 80 years ago. And by the way, Jack, the 80th anniversary is coming up. You ought to have a big celebration and sell a lot of books. Right? <laughs> uh, yes, sir. Yeah, this uh, works. So, uh, great presentation, and uh, you and I have spoken before. Uh, I just want to mention during the renovation of Pontchester, uh, it was a difficult, difficult time. And, but I think some of the comedy that had already existed in Parchester continued during that period, even though there was great opposition uh, to it. But at the end of the day, I remember one of the most vociferous opponent of it was a uh, gentleman from, I believe, Pakistan who wrote in the local newspaper. And used to, uh, the vitriol that he used to throw at people at the, at the board was just incredible. Finally, he came around. He says, you know, we really have to fix this place up. We have to get ourselves together. And he, and he one memorable thing he said, he says, you know, he says, where I come from, from pa Pakistan, we're fighting with India all the time. And there's a lot of Indians in Parkchester. This was back in uh, 2000 or so, a little before 2000. He says, but in Parkchester, we think of ourselves as being in one community. And that, those differences have completely uh, disappeared. So as a, and just as a, uh, and how that worked out. So we had the, the renovation involved, renovating 12,271 units, in order to do the renovation, you had to get access to each one of those apartments in a timely manner. Of that, from the six years that it took to renovate it, there was only about 20 locks that had to be broken in. And at some point in time, and it took a lot of work, everybody came together to, so we could get air conditioning in Park just as well as many of the other uh, good things about it. Well, Ladies and gentlemen, I rarely talk about heroes in my work. Really, that's not what I do. I talk about just plain folks. This guy is Michael Lappin. When you read the book, he was instrumental as a nonprofit with leaders of the financial community and others in restoring Parkchester. And he just told you a slice of all the things that he and his, and his, his compatriots did to do Parkchester over again, making it this place 
uh, after the many years of Helmsley. So, Michael, you're in the book, there's a picture of you, and I'm so happy, I'm very happy you're here. This guy deserves a round of applause. Yes. Um, really, really, really. So, we have time for one last question. One last question. Ah, go ahead. I know Professor Gorak is rocky. I'm going to go back a bit. Uh, rock. The 60s happened, and they changed America. What did you see as the impact? Of, uh, what was the impact of the 60s on an idyllic community like Parkchester when America was fractured? Okay, so what's, what, what is Parkchester like during this period of great change in America? Well, first of all, you know, the the ability of the Human Rights Commission in 68 to force Parkchester to desegregate was a positive outcome of that sort of thing. However, I write it in the book about my parents and their friends. My parents were liberals, and they we talked about what was going down on down south, and we mourned Schroeder, Goodman, and Cheney, two black, two Jews, one black, and all that stuff. But I argue in the book that we were, we were never tested on the civil rights issue. This Irene Horowitz had, an, had, an, had a son named Michael Horowitz who gives a speech at the Young Israel Park yesterday in which he says, in the, in the mid 60s, this is a community that's one third Catholic, one third Protestant, one third Jewish, he was wrong about the numbers. Don't you think there is room in Park Chester for, for African Americans? And the rabbi got up and said he praised him for his idealism. People shuffled their feet, but nothing was done. And I, there's some discussion about people in that congregation who had been civil rights activists in their youth who said, you know what? We're comfortable the way we are. And then I looked at uh, St. Raymond's Church, and there was a priest there who spoke, of, who spoke out. Of, he, he believed in uh, Catholic social activism. And one of his congregants said, if you like that, that so much, why don't you go to Venezuela and work among the poor? Or some of the South American country, and he did. So what, what, was, it, was there an undercurrent of racism? Or, you know, let me put it this way. When I look at white people and race, there are people who are strongly antagonistic, and there's some people who are strongly activist, and there are people like my folks who just have, I think, the right attitude but living their lives in comfortable the way things were. Okay? One last thing. During the destruction of the Bronx in the late 70s, the blackout, would you, call, would you recall? And so many neighborhoods were destroyed, like the Grand Concourse, etc. There's an article in the Bronx Press Review, a newspaper we used to get and normally wrap our fish in it, okay? but I used that newspaper in my research, said, Interestingly, there's one neighborhood, or the two neighborhoods, one in Riverdale, which isn't really the Bronx, Riverdale says it's Riverdale. In Parkchester, Parkchester, there's no destruction, no violence, and people help each other get up the, up the steps with flashlights and matches, etc. So we're part of it. Uh, there were some teachers in, in our congregation who were very upset about the Ocean Hill Brownsville activity. But that's where they were, not where they were back home. So I call that chapter a mixed, a mixed reception. Not everybody was happy with blacks moving in, but again, there was no organized opposition and no violence, and that's how people live their lives. So thanks a lot, everybody. Thank you. Uh, downstairs we have a kosher reception, uh, <laughs> a book signing, so do join us. My best friend was John Sullivan. I gave you his eulogy. Oh my goodness. And I'm going to take